few years ago when uh, Jean-Luc Pellet uh, joined the CMNS forum, I asked him whether he was familiar with the Dirac equations, and he said he was, and I had an immense relief because I did not want to do that. I wanted to go there, but not myself. And as a consequence, we've had a very productive um, collaboration since then. Uh, his wife is not doing well right now, so uh, he was not able to make the trip and uh, present this himself. Uh, I have put the uh, view graph, the slides, uh, up in the poster session for both this talk and my talk on, on Friday. And um, I will try to get up the information, uh, his commentary on these slides, which will be uh, deeper than I'm going to be having time for um, at this point. Uh, just as a background on what we've done and why we're doing it, the electron deep orbits, by the way, we have used the, uh, the French EDO rather than the US DOE for deep electron orbits um, or deep orbit electrons. Obviously, DOE has not supported us. <laughs> the key thing is that when we go to relativistic physics, we introduce the mass of the electron, and that goes into the potential. And this means then that we are talking about cross products, because we have to square these relationships. And this means now that we're coupling the mass with the energies, with the potential. And this is a critical thing. So relativity uh, introduces this as an important feature, and it shows up in the equations that we have a plus or minus square root. The plus sign gives the standard orbits, uh, the standard energies, and that's great. Everybody's happy with that. But nobody really wanted to address the negative sign because that gives negative energies and, uh, or generally gives negative energies, and people didn't see them. But there is actually the first of these orbits. These are the anomalous solutions. And it's singular as long as you go ahead and assume that the Coulomb potential is valid to r equals zero. But in reality, of course, you have a nucleus and that doesn't happen. And so we end up with a deep orbit as a result of that negative sign, which comes from the introduction of mass as a variable rather than as a constant, which can simply be dropped out because potentials are relative measurements. So the main features then of the uh, electron deep orbit solutions are very deep orbits with an average radius on the order of femtometers as compared to the uh, 50 picometers for the atomic orbitals. And then the special relativity is essential because it introduces the mass, but it also means that we now have effective masses and, effect, and high energies as a consequence of the, the relativistic effects. So if we actually are looking um, at what these orbits look like, we can see, this is in femtometers, we're looking at electron peaking in the femtometer range. Uh, and this then gives us something that is predicted by the, basically the fundamental uh, quantum mechanical equation, the Dirac equations, which include spin. But those are, orbits are also included in the Klein-Gordon equations, which are the relativistic Schrodinger equations. They don't include spin, but these deep orbits are still there. So this means then that we have the major equations in quantum mechanics predicting the presence of these deep orbits. And these are positive energy orbits. So why don't we see them? The question that comes up, if it's not really the ground state that we normally see and we have this deep orbit, why doesn't everything drop into it and the universe collapse? Well, the ground state in hydrogen is a zero angular momentum state, and the deep orbit is an angular momentum state of zero, and zero-zero transitions are highly forbidden. 
there are other possibilities of uh, getting to that, and those are things that uh, I will address at least one point of them uh, later on. But these equations were actually predicted in 1994 uh, by Mali and uh, by uh, Vavra and published in the um, Nuclear uh, Physics Journal and then ignored for the most part. There was arguments against it and one of the arguments which was against it, which actually was very useful, was the statement that in a two level system, the deep orbits would have a population of about two parts per billion of the atomic orbits. And that seems, hey, two parts per billion, you can forget that. Perturbation theory doesn't even look that, that deep. However, if you start talking about populations, 10 to the 22nd, 10 to the 23rd per cubic centimeter, all of a sudden now you're talking 10 to the 14th, 10 to the 15th in this deep orbit. Well, we can't really talk about uh, the two-level state because that bottom condition, once you have an electron in that orbit, the electron doesn't change, but the new atom, the femtoatom, does. The femtoatom now is basically what I call a fat neutron. It's a neutral particle that is in the femtometer size. So it can go right through a lattice, it can go right through a screening electron system, it can go right into the nucleus. And as I show more in the um, Friday talk, this means then that we start answering the things in cold fusion that really don't have other answers. So that's the background. So if, what, what Jean-Luc did, which was really sort of amazing, one of the major arguments and one that Akito raised years ago is that you can't have an electron bound in that deep orbit with that small dimension because the Heisenberg uncertain relationship says your energy has got to be on the order of 100 MeV. So Jean-Luc started from the other direction. He said, okay, assuming the Heisenberg uncertain relationship holds, what can we find out? And so he went ahead and did the mathematics and did the assumptions and found out that in fact I think we'll actually go back one more here. Because of relativity, you can actually end up with the energy of the electron on the order of 100 MeV. And this is sort of uh, interesting. And then the question, though, is that how do you confine something like that? How do you go ahead and keep it? 100 MeV electron bound uh, in that configuration. And so the question is, can it be done? And Jean-Luc's answer, yes. So following the math on down, we can come up with an interesting relationship, which is gamma the relativistic enhancement actually comes up to be the Coulomb wavelength divided by the de Broglie wavelength. And uh, that has a very nice ring to it. it. Sort of sounds like theoretical physics. But the main thing is that gamma is on the order of 200. And this is what gives the electron energy to be on the order of 100 MeV. Going through the equations, we really come up with the result is that the effective potential, when we actually look at the uh, effect, the effect of relativity on the potential, and remember, when you're talking relativity, you are concentrating the fields that the electron is encountering. And those concentrated fields give you much stronger forces. Those are the relativistic enhancement effects. So relativity then, is the source of the electron door, uh, deep orbits, but it's also the solution for the Heisenberg uncertain relationship. So 
So we've shown that the electron can exist in the deep orbit and can be confined there. The question is, is there any resonance there? Orbits are all resonances. And so Jean-Luc went looking for the resonances. If you start with the energy, and then go ahead and assume that the electron is bound by the Heisenberg uncertainty relationship and you introduce the corrections, you come up with a, what we call a sort of a Heisenberg energy. And this now is a one over R uh, relationship. So what it says then is let's look, using this relationship, let's look and see what we can find. And what we do, if you plot the kinetic energy in red and the potential in blue, we see it's never going to get there. But if you look at the green curve, this is the relativistic enhanced Coulomb potential. And when you get down to the nuclear level, there's two orders of magnitude difference. It's huge. And so this gives us the 100 MeV electron, and it says that the Coulomb potential the relativist, for a relativistic particle actually is able to bind it. In this region, the kinetic energy is greater than the potential energy. It's not bound. In this area now, this is the, uh, the, the radius here where the potential and the kinetic energy cross. In reality, the burial theorem says that the potential energy is twice the kinetic energy puts us down here, so it solves the atomic orbitals just using this equation, which is pretty neat. But you don't get a crossover again until we get out here to the relativistic range, to the, to the nuclear range. And that is interesting because the relativistic virial theorem says that the potential energy and the kinetic energy come together. So here we have classical physics, relativistic physics, quantum physics, all beginning to come together, and they're tied together with the Heisenberg uncertain relationship, which eliminates one of the major arguments against this model. Now, looking at more details of the uh, equations and the potentials, we end up seeing that we have a potential here that in fact has two potential wells. This is the Bohr atom potential well. This is the deep orbit potential well. And there are resonances as a consequence in both areas. Now, the question that uh, Jean-Paul posed, I think it was yesterday, it's hard to say time-wise, the strange things, said, okay, how do you get from here to here? You can't get there by photons. You can get there by uh, two photon um, emission, where you now end up having a, uh, I'm sorry, two electron decay, which gives you a angular momentum of zero, zero transition. You can do it probably by an Auger process. Again, the highly forbidden process. But there's something which just sort of hit me here is that going from here to here, we're talking tunneling. And we're talking tunneling through a fairly narrow barrier. So there's no reason not to tunnel. But the uh, quantum mechanical equations, which look at the population, relative population of the two, it doesn't say how it gets there. It simply looks at the overlap between the wave functions. And that fits, and everything seems to agree. So looking at the fine details, once you start getting close to the nucleus, things which are fine and hyperfine structure at the atomic levels all of a sudden become very important. And uh, when you start getting to the nuclear level, they dominate. So we have two things here. We have the self-energy. and vacuum polarization, these effects now actually can be pretty strong. But the self-energy effect is greater than the uh, vacuum polarization. So as a repulsive uh, force, it keeps the electron outside of the nucleus. 
when you start talking about these deep effects, the spin-spin effect, which can be totally ignored in the uh, atomic case, now becomes the dominant feature. And in fact, to keep the fit to the orbit, the deep orbit, you have to assume only the repulsive spin-spin interaction. What struck me is that, okay, what happens if you assume the uh, attractive interaction? And uh, Jean-Luc sort of backed away from that. But in fact, it gives you a very small radius well inside the nucleus. And I said, that begins to sound like they're talking about quarks or components of quarks. So it looks like when you start talking about relativity, my own feeling is that now the strong nuclear forces are in fact relativistic Coulomb forces. And that's something that we want to play with in the future. So in consequence, we do have, just as a model, and he's uh, an applied mathematician, so he does these equations and cranks out these things very nicely. We have the relativistic enhancement over 200, but it still gives us a binding energy on the half MeV level, which is what is predicted by the Dirac equation. And so this is sort of nice that we actually have the very high energies, but the potential energy and the kinetic energy balance in such a way that we're still allowed to have this binding energy. But this binding energy is critical to cold fusion. Jean-Luc says, well, once we get into this area, we really have to go into QED. So that's one of the things which we're having to evaluate. And looking at these things now, we're actually talking about the models the nuclear models, and this is one of the reasons why I'm interested in uh, what Norman uh, Cook is doing, and which we will go into tonight in greater detail. What's actually happening? What are the components going on in there? So cold fusion is the transition between atomic and nuclear physics, but it also may give us answers to what's going on in the nuclear physics field. So. Jean-Luc is, is looking at the nuclear uh, effects, but he's also looking at the relativistic atomic levels, the high Z components, and uh, using the uh, way of sort of hone his uh, quantum electrodynamics skills, which he's learning. I could never do something like that. So in conclusion then, Relativity solves the Heisenberg uncertainty uh, relationship uh, issue, and it introduces the possibilities, and the calculations give us possibilities of residence near uh, the nucleus. Did I say residence or resonance? Close enough either way. Nevertheless, what we're doing is actually first cuts, and a lot of refinement needs to be carried out still. But it's interesting that there are other people beginning to approach this problem, and uh, we're looking forward to that. So we're trying to go ahead and gain some experience from what is well known from the high Z uh, elements, the relativistic effects there. And we really think that the deep orbit model gives us a means to look at energy transfer without gamma or without energetic uh, particles. And uh, this goes back then to internal conversion and the process of even the weak interaction. My own feeling is that the weak interaction is weak simply because it's not very probable. But in fact, once you start having deep orbit electrons, you're spending a lot of time, not just in passing through, but in staying close to the nucleus so the weak interactions can, in fact, become much stronger. Then, until I convince Jean-Luc, I'm going to have to go it alone. Uh, I have the, my own feeling is that there's also orbits which are not obedient to what we consider the Heisenberg uncertainty relationship. But once we understand what the uncertainty relationship really talks about, I think we can actually find that there are electrons that are in the MeV level, not the 100 MeV level, in these deep orbits. And this gives us another set of um, things to play with. 
So we're in an active mode, and Jean-Luc is very energetic, and I'm very thankful for it because I have my own family responsibilities. And uh, so I'm depending upon him to do a lot of the work. But I'm still trying to keep up with him. Thank you. Uh, there are any questions? Reminds me of nuclear magnetic resonance potential application to looking at different orbits above that ground state orbit. Have you looked at that issue and whether it's possible at all? That's a very interesting point, and we have not looked at that yet, uh, but it's something, thank you for, for mentioning it. I think it's, uh, it's actually one of the things that I think helped Mills in some of his ideas, and I think we can look at it here and see. However, we really don't have the population yet, and only until we can get to the high population, although it's interesting that with the halo nuclei, which are basically, my guess is, in fact, they are, in fact, uh, what I would call femtomolecules. If you have a hydrogen femtoatom with radius on the order of a few fermi, then you can actually form a molecule which has spacings on a few fermi. And this is basically what the halo nuclei do. So here we have something that is measured to great accuracy with a relatively low population. So this is one of the things that I'm hoping we're able to come together and get enough cold fusion going that in a situation where we can examine the products and look at things. And at that point, I think we'll have a test of what's actually happening. It was my impression that the weak interaction between electron and proton is repulsive. Um, it, it's repulsive. It's an exchange of a Z naught. Um, I think. Okay, my my view on that is... I mean, is, that's hypercharge, yeah. right? That's how they measure hypercharge. You bring an electron yeah. into a proton, it repels off, exchanges Z naught. As, we're really talking now about not just quarks, but components. And when we start talking about relativistic effects, we have charged particles that are relativistic, and they're going to interact, and there will be both relativity, relativistic enhancement in repulsion and attraction. And one of Norman Cook's comments was that there is a phase relationship which is critical. Well, here we now have orientation and phase relationships, so I think things are going to be coming together on that. I don't think we can be bound by the sta uh, standard model. It doesn't accept deep orbits. Once we introduce deep orbits and the interaction between mass and potential and relativistic enhancement, I think things are going to change. But thanks for the question. Larry? Yeah, so you raise an interesting point here. If indeed you've got these beasties out there, and you have something that is a halo nucleus, such as produced at the Michigan Superconducting Cyclotron. If you can get one of those into a deep orbital state, you ought to rapidly change its decay rate. And so the question becomes, people have made these measurements, and the question then is, are the decays of some of these halo nuclei, they're way off the drip line, mm -hmm. are they in fact evidence of this? You are actually addressing a point which this group has an advantage and a disadvantage. We have a lot of breadth and sometimes not the depth we want, but you're bringing up points that I never would have thought about and information I want. So it's something, remind me later when. Yeah, I will, because, because what becomes important is how you in fact make these. Well, to some extent, the paper I give on Friday will address greatly what happens what do you have when you have a relativistic electron? You have very, very strong fields. The field, the forces from those fields drop off at 1 over r, not 1 over r squared. So the effect is much greater than the Coulomb potentials. And the frequencies are much higher. So the interaction now is with nucleons and quarks or subnucleon components rather than with atomic electrons. So here's one last thought that's in support of what you said, that the strong force may in fact be a relativistic Coulomb force. Absolutely. When you have highly relativistic electrons, the magnetic field effect is what's dominating. Exactly. Yeah. 
and the spin, which isn't well defined, ties into that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. <clears throat>